Hello, I'm Professor Brothers, and this is Engineering Design Processes for ECE 3872, which is Fundamentals of Design. So here are the topics that I'm going to go over in the slideshow today. Why do we need a process? And then I'm going to go over a couple of processes, the waterfall model, the agile design process, and the V design process. So first off, why do we even need a model? What is it, or a process? What is this process? So first, let's look at the two types of groups that are really developing stuff for the engineering world, for you know putting it out there on the internet and everything. So the first is hobbyists. You know, for a hobbyist, they create a device, they document the design and build process. And then they share the design, put it out there. They, they might have a blog. They might share it with Adafruit or SparkFun. A lot of these websites, they're good designs. And they put them out there, and you get what, what they are. They might not. They might have bugs in them. You don't know. So now, what's the difference between a hobbyist and a professional? Professional engineer first starts off meeting with the customer and a design team to generate a requirement. They create a document. Then they meet with an interdisciplinary team and generate a design. And then they create lots of documents. Then they consider the life cycle of the design and examine manufacturing, maintenance, and disposal. So the entire life of the product. They create lots of documents. Then they create a prototype and test. Again. They create lots of documents as the output of this. The, the list goes on. It continues in the same manner. But one thing that you can see that's a common refrain, there's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of steps. So it's a much more involved um, process in order to actually bring a product to market. So because of this, we use process to make sure we cross all the T's and dot all the I's to make sure we don't miss a document or miss an important step. So basically, through the course of engineering history, there are all these lessons learned. And they say, wow, it's really important to do this step because in the past something has failed because this was not done. And so the way it's captured is in a process. So now let's look a little bit more in how an engineering device comes into the real world. So this is the ideal design flow. So engineering design is a combination of software, electrical, mechanical, it could be chemical, a lot of other things come into it. So in a perfect world, linear flow, you start with some simulation. This might be mathematical, this might be a software simulation, it might be an equation that you have just in a notebook. There's something that is the mathematical basis of what you're going to do. Then you do some software designing, some electrical designing, some electrical build, then some mechanical design, then the mechanical build, the assembly test. And in this ideal flow, everything happens sequentially. So they're not interacting with each other. But as we know, this isn't the way things really work. Linear flow doesn't work. Nobody does it. We don't have enough time to do that. So what happens, things happen in parallel. Usually we do start off with a simulation. But there might be a mechanical simulation, an electrical simulation, a software simulation. So there might be a whole arena of simulations. Those drive down into the design, the software design, and that usually influences the electrical design and mechanical design. Then we have the builds, and then you uh, integrate and test, and you do design changes, and you go back to the beginning, and you redo it. And then finally, it comes out. You do the final assembly and test the entire system as it is. This is leaving out a lot of steps, but you get the idea. It's not a clear cut A, then B, then C. You go back, you loop through it, and some problem that comes up in the electrical might impact the mechanical, it might impact the thermal, it might impact the packaging. So everything is flowing into each other, and they're all happening in parallel. So a little process is a good thing. This is the Integrated Defense Acquisition Technology and Logistics Life Cycle Management System. Um, this is the process that is used by the Department of Defense in order to acquire systems. And this is called the horse blanket. Um, so you can see there's all this stuff going on and there's all these boxes and 
so the diamonds usually represent like uh, milestones and or here's here's some more triangles these are milestones excuse me the milestones and then these are big events so this is post CDRA and then we can look down in here and CDR post CDR we can see post CDR and if we look in a little bit further we can squint our eyes and maybe find the CDR bubble in there that's an event critical design review we also see that it has a lot of these V type shapes and they circle back on themselves so a little bit of a process is a good thing but this is where it gets crazy this design is trying to capture everything in one so we can go with this process from very simplistic to very complex and depending on your organization it might be a little bit it might be a lot here's a zoomed in view of the PDR CDR from the horse blanket so in this box, these are the inputs, the interface control document and draft, the CDD, I'd have to actually go back and look at what all these acronyms are. Um, and here's the exit criteria of how to get out of this stage. And then we go into this V design where the end of it is this SRR. Again, I'd have to go and look at what the acronym uh, means. but all through this it is flowing from one to another and it is specifying the inputs and the outputs of this process and one of the important things down at the bottom here this little circle PDR preliminary design review we're going to have a PDR and we're going to have a CDR in our class but you can see in the real processes such as this DOD process which is a very detailed very in-depth process but many industries have taken pieces out of this and so this is a very very common terminology that you're going to find so PDR if you're successful you shift over to this other side and you start this next process of the B milestone and once you get through this one it comes all the way down and here is this little bubble CDR critical design review and again it has inputs outputs these are all the documents that you must create so this process if you ever get into the Department of Defense world this process takes years to learn literally years to learn there are classes there are certifications that you must go through in order to learn this process we're going to be a lot more simplified but we're going to pull aspects of this so please know please take away from this these processes are real they're used they're applied pretty much industry-wide they can be complex they can be simple we're going to start out very simple and just know through your career you'll learn more and more and more there's no way we can teach you a complete entire process in this class but what is a good engineering design process because there's a whole bunch of them so you need to take from the customer view a good engineering design is desirable features so good performance must be robust reliable and secure when you create a product these are the things that the customer is looking for come from the company's view when you do an engineering design the process has to emphasize that it is testable scalable interoperable expandable maintainable reusable and then the cornerstone of all of this is documentation documentation that means there is capability of supporting the life, life cycle of a device so let's go and talk back about that hobbyist again the hobbyist is not worried about supporting his device for the life cycle that means the entire time that it is out in the world before I came um, to work as a professor at Georgia Tech I was working on DOD projects and many of the platforms that we were working on were from the 70s and the 80s and they're still flying 40 50 years later so there's no way you can see into the future and see what technology is going to be like in 40 or 50 years but what you must do is document your design well enough that when the engineers in the future come and look at your design they're able to maintain it to support it to uh, replace obsolete components and that's the difference between the hobbyist and the professional and that's why we need the process so the design process really important customer discovery and needs analysis we're going to talk with the customer to determine what he really wants or she really wants 
What need would the product fulfill? Is this driven by the market forces? Is it social needs, such as the need for clean water, artistic needs, techno art? Who are the stakeholders? Who cares if this product succeeds or fails? Who are they really trying to market to? This is explored in this process. Ideation and system decomposition. Requirements analysis. Functional, performance, safety, interfacing, security. These all need to go into the requirements analysis. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take all these customer needs, all these requirements, and put them into tasks and system decomposition. So we're going to break the problem into smaller problems, and we're going to break that into smaller problems. And as we go through that process, we're going to arrive at something where we can actually resolve the output and have some sort of easily break apart, something that we can break apart into small tasks and distribute amongst the engineers and develop in parallel. So, topics. Next, we're going to go in and look at the waterfall model. Here's, this is a traditional water, uh, traditional model. Um, oftentimes, this is what companies used to use. Not, not a lot of companies use this anymore. You'd go from requirements that would flow down into a design. From there, the design would flow down into an implementation and then verification, and then it flows down into maintenance. So this is one of the things we call this is throwing it over the fence. So you'd start, you'd get requirements, and usually it was a team getting the requirements, and then they'd throw it over the fence to the next batch of engineers who are then going to work on that design. And then they get done, and they take it, and they throw it over the fence to the people who are actually going to implement it, manufacture it, and then they take it and throw it over the fence. So a lot of this, it works very well if you think of like a Model T assembly line style engineering application. But it does not work very well in the modern world where we have a lot of software involved and it needs to flow back into itself and that software gets redeveloped all the time to the changing uh, situation. So not a lot of people use this anymore. But think about this as like an assembly line for making things. This is the origins. So in order to help, we're going to look at the Agile design process now. This was the key term for a very long time. Everybody was talking Agile. So the way the Agile process works, they run in sprints. And these are fixed lengths of time intervals. So instead of saying we're going to do this task based on how long the task is going to take, it works the opposite. You say all sprints are going to be, say, for instance, one week. And then you scope the work to fit in that one week time frame. And then, so each one week, you do planning meeting for the sprint, you do daily scrums, which are 15 minute stand up meetings. That, that's it, you go and you, you meet, you go and work. Sprint review, at the end of the sprint, you review and you do a retrospective. Then you look at the backlog requirements, you determine the team capital for the project actions. Basically what that means, you look at your to-do list and figure out what's the most important thing to sprint on next. And you attack that next sprint. So in this manner, you can take a very long to-do list, prioritize it, and focus on resolving an issue each week and moving on to the next. This works really, really, really well for software because it is such a, a, a fluid structure that you can attack small things and get them done and put something big together. Software also, oftentimes software never ends. You're always going to release patches. You're always going to release updates. So this is a long-term design cycle because that to-do list, that backlog, could always have something on it. So this is a great process to apply to more software-centric, more tech-oriented type companies. Um, uh, think of like the dot-coms that are moving into the auto industry. For instance, Tesla is a big, big one right now. This would be a good process that they most likely would apply. I don't know what process Tesla applies. I'd be curious to find out. V design process. So in this process, we start out, we look at the customer discovery and the needs, 
and then we do a design. On the left side of the V, we break it apart, we decompose that into smaller and smaller parts. Usually, I do it in three layers, the system, the subsystem, the component. Then at the very bottom, we build each of those. You start doing the design at the top, so top-down design, and then bottom-up implementation. So we start by designing at the big layer, breaking it apart into small little boxes, and then you give those little boxes to engineers to actually build. They build those little boxes, then you put them together to make bigger and bigger and bigger until you get the completed system. So you build the components, you test the components, and then you integrate, oops, I'm sorry, flicked it too many times. You integrate the components and test the subsystems. You integrate the subsystems and test, test the overall system. And then uh, modern V designs, they have a couple more. This is from ISO 15288, ISO International Standards Organization. They uh, standardize a lot of processes. And you can see now we also have maintenance and disposal because we're looking at the complete life cycle for the product. This way, at each stage, there are feedback loops. So say that you start to test and it fails. You go back and redesign and then you rebuild, retest the components, retest the subsystem, and then you go up to the system level. And you might have to go back and redesign again and go all the way through the process again. So this process is a very good process to use in a hardware-centric platform where the design is harder to change. So something such as a hardware system where you might have a lot of physical components that are being fabricated, it's harder to change than software. So the one week time frame might not be adequate to do a lot of the hardware centric structures. So this one tends to be more globalization, where more like big picture that's being broken down. All right, so those are the engineering design processes that we're gonna talk about in this class. We're going to go into the Agile process and the V-Design process in more detail in future lectures. I hope you take these and consider using these for your design project. We're not going to require that you do anything for your design project, but if I were you, I would really consider doing an Agile style process for your software and then a V-Design for your hardware. This would be very handy in exploring these processes and trying to apply some structure to your design. Um, it helps everybody stay on the same page. All right, thank you very much.